Hello, uh, welcome to this HDF webinar. Uh, it is my great pleasure and privilege to introduce uh, Mr. Lucas Villarreal, um, who, as many of you will remember, secured himself a prominent spot in HDF history with his, in double quotes, plain doom in HDF 5 presentation at HUG, at last year's HUG 2020. Uh, he just released version 1.2 of HDR5 UDF, um, about which he will tell us more today. And I would like to take a moment to summarize why I'm uh, so excited about this work and see it continue and grow. Um, as all of you know, um, in HDR5, uh, we have basically two concepts, two core concepts. One of them is the concept of a variable. And um, they come in different forms, uh, better known are array variables, but uh, uh, in newer versions we also have map variables. And these array variables sort of can be used as data sets and attributes. And if you think about it, well, the value of such an array variable or data sets as we call them is an array. And a lot of people, when they hear array, they think of it, well, they, they are these sort of rectilinear, these uh, rec uh, yeah, rectilinear arrangements of value cells that are um, uh, represented in memory or in some kind of storage. But I think, and uh, UDF, HDF5 UDF uh, makes that clear, it is actually more fruitful to think of them as grid functions, um, functions whose domain uh, is sort of a subset of a rectilinear lattice, and the value uh, is the element type uh, uh, of that uh, grid function, of that data set. Uh, why is that the case? Well, because in a way it brings into focus this trade-off between how much time does it to compute something and versus uh, how much memory, how, how much storage do you actually need to uh, represent or persist um, such a function? And in HDF5, before HDF5 UDF, the picture was a little bit bleak or black and white in the sense that, yeah, you could delay the uh, allocation, as we called it, uh, of a data set. And if you wanted to represent a constant function, you could just define a uh, uh, fill value and then say, well, until somebody writes to that data set, nothing gets allocated, but if somebody reads from it, well, they will just get that constant value, and that was certainly very efficient, but the moment the first element that was not equal to this fill value was written, you either, with contiguous layout, had to allocate the whole thing, or if it was chunked, you had to at least allocate the chunk that this particular value, value fell into. And um, so with HDF5 UDF, uh, Lucas introduced programmable data sets, as he calls them. I, 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 I like to think of them maybe more a little bit like a storage layout in the old terminology. and. Uh, where you can represent the value of a data set, that array, that array variable. Um, uh, if there is a simple analytical expression, for example, to generate the values in that data set or variable, there's no reason to really persist those values. You can, it might be cheaper and faster to actually just compute them at runtime. And uh, another great thing about these uh, programmable data sets is now for the first time, we, we always have this concept of arbitrarily extendable data sets. Well, with HDF5 UDF, they, they are indeed, uh, they can have infinite extent. You can just keep on incre incrementing time steps or extending and just compute new values. And so they can actually be infinite uh, despite the fact that we have only a finite amount of storage. And finally, uh, there can be a discussion about uh, the technical implementation of this, whether you use the filter pipeline or whether you use a virtual object layer plugin. But nevertheless, I, for me personally, this, this is a, a completely novel approach and it's a, it's a first-rank contribution to the HDF5 ecosystem. And uh, it, my, my personal opinion is that I think this will change 
profoundly the way uh, we think about and use HDF in the future. So with that, uh, I would like to turn it over to Lucas and I look forward to a great presentation. Okay, well, thank you so much for the nice words. Uh, so, uh, well, uh, thanks everybody for uh, attending this uh, presentation. Uh, I am uh, going to do my best uh, to make sure that you uh, enjoy it. So this is a, a presentation on data virtualization with uh, user-defined functions for HDF5 and how it can streamline your work. Okay, so I am pretty sure uh, most of you have seen this traditional data pipeline before, right? So basically we have this uh, ETL, which is uh, called uh, extract, transform and load process. So given a piece of raw data, you are going to uh, extract elements of that data so it can uh, get prepared for further transformations like uh, filtering and so on. And then uh, once you are finished, you finally load that data uh, to start uh, doing analytics uh, on top of it. And as input to the raw data, uh, you can have, uh, say, IoT devices or file system uh, or object storage, web services, the list goes and goes and goes and uh, it, it can be pretty much anything. Uh, on the extraction side, uh, one particular process that happens quite often is the transformation or translation between different data formats. So sometimes you may download the data that comes in GeoTIFF but you have a pipeline that expects to work with HDF5, or you get a CSV and you have, again, to translate between data formats so that the transformation steps can consume the data. Uh, and some of the common transformations that you see include the cleansing data, aggregating data, or blending them, uh, normalizing data, and so on. And there is one particular uh, thing to mention here, which is the fact that as you start to create derivations of the original data, or as you start to uh, filter and create uh, new versions of that data, you are ending up uh, duplicating data, right? So you have the raw data, you have a copy of that raw data, which is uh, uh, data translated into a different format. Then you have another copy, which is the cleansed version and so on and so forth. And this ends up uh, not only adding more uh, into your storage, but also uh, if you are concerned about tracking the provenance of your data, uh, this becomes quite complicated to track. Uh, you may want to delete some of those temporary files. I don't know. Uh, if you do, then you have to make sure that the reference uh, that you have on your data lineage database uh, is uh, ref reflecting that the fact that you just deleted uh, the temporary file from this. So. You see, this, this can become quite uh, uh, complex uh, without uh, uh, too much effort from the user side. And if you look into some of, the, some of the transformations that are commonly performed, many of them are very simple uh, and they can be expressed in uh, a handful of lines. So as we can see here in this example, uh, we're looking into a, a snippet that takes a satellite uh, data from the Landsat mission. And this uh, data is basically comprised of different bands, each band representing uh, a range of the uh, light spectrum. And some of those uh, bands that I'm loading in this example are the near infrared and the red band. And one operation that we see uh, being performed quite often in uh, remote sensing is the computation of what's called NDVI, which stands for Normalized uh, uh, Difference Vegetation Index. And the idea here is to estimate uh, which pixels are uh, representing vegetation. And the computation is quite simple. It's uh, just a, a division between uh, two operations. And often we compute this and we store the result uh, back on a, to disk. So we can later on, uh, verify uh, this data and, and use it for other uh, computation uh, uh, purposes. And this is quite trivial and yet it is adding up, you know, more space in a linear fashion to, to, to the data set. So given this context, uh, I would like to present you uh, user-defined functions for UDF and how it applies to what I just uh, mentioned. So a traditional application flow using HDF5 files is uh, 
mostly comprised of an application uh, that provides, uh, say, numerical grids to, to the API. So when it's writing those grids, it is basically calling a high-level function from ADF5. It passes that grid. And then that grid go, go, goes to disk. Uh, and then when the application requests to read that data back from disk, just the opposite uh, happens. You get the data from disk. Uh, you, you instantiate that as a, a volume uh, 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 data set, and you provide the result to the application. Uh, now, when we introduce user-defined functions, we have a slightly different application flow. So on the right-hand side, what we have now uh, is uh, an application that instead of providing a grid, it provides a piece of source code, like a Python code or a C++ code. This source code is going to contain the instructions that I just presented in the previous slides. So we have the NDVI computation, for example. Uh, and then uh, this UDF engine takes care of taking that piece of code, compiling it into a loadable object format, like a bytecode or a sh shared library. And then that is the unit that's ultimately stored on disk. This is on the right path. And when we have the application uh, requesting to read that data set, what happens is uh, we have a handler, a UDF handler, that retrieves that object from disk, executes it, and then as output, it's going to produce a data set. And that data set is finally provided to the application. And the, the difference here is that on the left-hand side, we have data sets that usually are comprised of megabytes, gigabytes, or terabytes of data. On the right-hand side, we have a bytecode, we have a library, which is typically in the order of a, a few kilobytes. And what's most important here is the fact that the data transformation on that previous pipeline I shown you before is not uh, performed anymore at the time that you are ingesting the data, but rather it is happening when you read the data. So this piece of code is only going to execute when the application requests to access the data. Otherwise, you will just have the uh, overhead of ingesting the raw data into your uh, storage system. So underneath, uh, what we are using, oops, advanced one slide, sorry. So underneath, uh, what we are using is a technology called uh, IO filters. This is part of uh, the HDF5 infrastructure. And it is basically uh, a, a, a system which allows you to build your own plugins. And those plugins are then loadable uh, at runtime. So you can have plugins to compress the data using different algorithms, like uh, is it to deflate, hmm. deflate uh, LZO, and so, so on. Uh, and as you can see on the left-hand side uh, on this image, the input data is provided to the high-level write function of HDF5. And what happens is uh, you also provide a chunk size. So the data is split into uh, fixed size uh, chunks. And each of those chunks is then processed by an instance of, of an IO filter. And that IO filter is, is, the, is the entity that is going to compress the data. So often the output is a smaller uh, chunk size uh, than what you had before, and then you store that on disk. And when you request from the application to read the data back, uh, we just go back uh, on the other uh, direction. So we have the compressed data, we provide it to the IO filter, which decompresses it, and then uh, you get the original chunk data, and then uh, HDF5 is going to blend the data and stitch it together, so you get the original input data. Uh, as the application requests and expects. So uh, having said this, uh, I want to show you the big picture uh, of the UDF system for HDF5. And this is uh, the current uh, status as version 1.2. So the full stack uh, is comprised of three different backends. One of them is able to handle C and C++. And in this case, what uh, is given to the UDF is a piece of code written in C++, which gets compiled by uh, GCC or uh, also by CLang. And as output, you get a shared library. For Lua, we have a Lua JIT. So it's a just-in-time compiler for Lua, which produces a bytecode 
And when you execute that bytecode, it's actually uh, executed by a virtual machine that is, based, is able to uh, optimize your code as you run it. And on the right-hand side, you have Python. Uh, so we get Python code. We have the CPython interpreter uh, producing a bytecode. And then the CPython VM executes that code later on. So this is uh, uh, the way it stands uh, as of today. And besides having three languages, we have a single API. So there is a single entry point called dynamic data set. Uh, it outputs nothing. It gets nothing as input. All the data exchange is performed through what we call foreign push, uh, function interfaces. So we get uh, direct pointers to the data that's been allocated by the UDF engine. So we get uh, this high level function called the lib get data, and you provide the name of the data set. And then you can read that data if that data set happens to be an input, or you can write to it if that's the output that you are producing. Uh, we also have APIs to get the dimensions of that data set, to get the type. And then you can have all of those uh, native data types. And we also have support for strings and for compounds, which are basically data structures that uh, mimic uh, the C, a C structure. And we also have a helper a utility to write to a given compound member, which uh, is of a string type. So this function takes care of uh, making sure you're not uh, writing uh, beyond the, the, the uh boundary of that buffer so an example here uh python uh udf looks like this so you have uh, a dynamic data set uh, function in this case we have two input variables or data sets a and b and we have an output data set c uh, and what we do is we just uh, iterate over each uh, element of the inputs and we just store uh, the sum of A and B on C. And to call or to uh, embed this routine on a HDF5, we call this uh, utility called HDF5 UDF, providing the file name uh, for the HDF5, the UDF code, and then the name of the output variable. And then as output, what happens uh, is we are going to get a metadata uh, along with the UDF, and both uh, are going to be stored uh, as the primary elements of that data set. So instead of having a numerical grid saved to the data set inside the HDF5 file, we have the bytecode and this uh, JSON uh, metadata that is going to assist the UDF uh, engine to interpret the bytecode and know about which inputs are needed before the code can execute. So this is very much it. Uh, also, if you look into the function, uh, it is possible to determine that uh, C is an output uh, because you're writing to C. And uh, for this reason, it is possible to completely omit the specification of what's the output variable, variable name. In this case, the uh, utility will assume that the data type and the dimensions of the output data uh, are going to be the same as their inputs. So this is the requirement to use this, uh, this uh, uh, facility. Uh, the API for C, C++ is very much the same as the one I've shown you before. Uh, here we have a uh, API that uh, is able to, to get data that's uh, in float, in integer, in, in, in many different native data sets. And basically, uh, you get the same output as before not uh, too much to say about this. Uh, in Lua, the very same idea applies. Uh, the only difference here is that indexes in Lua start with uh, one instead of zero, but overall it's the same. Okay, so let me uh, go back to the original example that uh, we were talking a few minutes ago. So we have this traditional data pipeline, right? So how can uh, HDF5 UDF help you uh, when you have such a complex pipeline uh, on your work, on your workflow. Uh, so this is what I'm going to show you now, uh, starting with a uh, file system. So let us assume that we have, uh, one second, okay. Uh, 
Okay, there you go. So let us assume that you have a file that uh, were provided to you as a, uh, an input to your pipeline, and it's a GeoTIFF file. Uh, as you can see here, we have a GeoTIFF, which is uh, roughly 200 uh, megabytes in size. And what we want to do is we want to ingest it into our pipeline uh, in an easy way, right? We don't, we don't want to translate data and create a lot of copies. So let me show you what we can do with uh, UDF. Uh, so here we have an example uh, of an UDF which reads uh, a GeoTIFF uh, uh, data set that I'm creating. Uh, it reads an input file in TIFF. And what it does is it uh, outputs the TIFF uh, file into the output uh, data set that I created uh, using HDFI UDF. Uh, you see that uh, the image is basically being uh, read as a NumPy array. I'm flattening it so it becomes a single dimension uh, data. And then you know that data is finally output. So to read, uh, sorry, to embed this uh, into uh, data set, I just execute this uh, command, uh, which takes the existing empty data set as input, the TIFF uh, UDF, and the, the dimensions and data type that I want to have as output. You see that I've, get, uh, I've got the same header as I've shown you before with the uh, uh, bytecode size that was produced with the backend that needs to execute uh, when I open this UDF, uh, the output resolution and other metadata. And if we look back into the size of the data, we can see that it's, it's slightly larger than before. Uh, now it's six kilobytes. Uh, an empty uh, file was, uh, let me see if I can see it. It was uh, uh, 800 bytes. So it's, it's, uh, it's not a big deal. And now what happens is I have a data set which is mapping requests to read this uh, uh, HDF5 into reads to, to the GeoTIFF file. So let's see something cool here. Uh, I'm going to show you uh, a GIS uh, application. This is a uh, Saga GIS. It's a, it's a quite well known uh, utility that lets you handle data sets uh, for purposes of uh, running, say, uh, uh, filters to, to, to run pre-processing before you ingest the data into uh, numerical weather models and so on. So I'm going to request to open the file that I have just created. OK. Uh, something happened here. Oh, it says it's stuck. Okay, so let me take a look at what's happening here. So, so well, here we have the GeoTIFF file. Uh, I want to read the it's, uh, minus the. There you go. So it's actually going to the TIFF file and it's uh, reading. Oh, looks like uh, my machine was swapping or something. Sorry, it's uh, it just uh, completed executing it. Yeah, so there you go. Sorry for the delay. I think uh, I, I was just running out of uh, memory here. So uh, what happens here is uh, you see it's uh, it's the, the original data in TIFF has been loaded through the HDF5 file, and it's it's here. Uh, I can deal with it. I can you know uh, visualize the data, and I have not have to convert the data into a large uh, copy of the original data. I'm just doing the translation on the fly. Okay, so uh, this is uh, just an example of what we can do with the file system. So we can virtualize uh, data, right? We can uh, take data in one format and uh, expose it as if it were uh, UDF, uh, HDF5. 
Uh, I have another example here, which is uh, quite nice. Uh, this one comes from uh, uh, numerical, sorry, from uh, NLP. Uh, so this is for uh, natural language processing. And I'm going to show you a, a web page here. So this is a profile that summarizes a particular uh, type of data that's ingested uh, when you're training uh, a, a linguistic model. So it's a pretty much, uh, pretty much a, a CSV file format. Uh, you have uh, integers, strings, uh, more integers, and so on, and date objects. And they are separated by a special character, which is uh, the app character. So let me show you this uh, input. So it's very much a CSV, but with instead of commas, we have a, another uh, separated, right? And what I'm going to do here is to map this CSV as uh, HDFI. So what I'm going to do here is uh, I'm going to write this uh, dynamic data set function, which reads the input and basically populates each element of my compound uh, according to each uh, element uh, split from the CSV. So I have the uh, ID element uh, being set here. I have the set string. Uh, function which uh, populates the origin uh, string element from the item compound with the data taken from elements uh, index one and so on. Uh, let me run this command so I can create the UDF. And now uh, I am going to show you uh, this is uh, the output of H5LS. I'm basically dumping the data from HDF5. And you can see that I have all the elements of the CSV here. And what is very nice here uh, is the fact that I can also modify CSV. And then when I read back HDF5, I, I'm going to see the, the change here. So let's uh, take a look at one, one particular element of this uh, input uh, file. So I'm going to read the 10th element of the HDF5 file. And I see that I, I have a sentence here. A baby is licking a dog. All right. Not my fault. Uh, so I'm going to change this. Let's say that's not a good idea. And I've modified the CSV file, and I'm going to dump the HDF5 file now. And I see that uh, I've got the modified data. So this is dynamic translation happening uh, in real time. OK, so another thing that uh, is often uh, uh, part of data ingestion pipelines is uh, the retrieval of data that's hosted elsewhere, like uh, on web services. And I have also an example here that's uh, quite uh, interesting, especially for those uh, working with uh, uh, weather and uh, natural sciences, which is uh, the use of weather radar. So we can use HDF5 to retrieve data from weather uh, uh, radars on the fly. So if we look into the web page of the National Weather Service, we can get a list of uh, many uh, radars that are available for querying. Each of those radars have a list of products or data sets that we can uh, uh, get. And what I'm doing here is I'm, uh, I, I'm writing a UDF that takes the base radio velocity of uh, the radar that's uh, in uh, close to the Chicago O'Hare Airport. So I'm going to show you the code. So I'm using this uh, function from uh, the OWS library called the Web Map Service. So given a web service uh, GeoServer uh, address, uh, I can request to read certain layers of that, uh, of that service. And in this case, I'm requesting to read from the TORD, which is the code for the International Airport, and the, uh, the base radio velocity layer from that, uh, from that place. I am reading that data into a JPEG uh, PNG format. Then uh, what I do is I create a lookup table uh, based on each RGB uh, uh, component that I read. I store that on a lookup table. And then I store both that data and the color palette uh, on two different data sets. One of them is going to be called radio velocity. The other one is going to be palette. Uh, let me run this code for you. 
SDK, that's quite simple. This one is based on Python. Uh, and uh, I have now a script that is uh, going to uh, launch X terminal uh, using a small font uh, size four. Uh, and it will basically uh, read the data set that I created. So it's going to provide the radio velocity data set, the color palette. And then I'm going to show it uh, as an ASCII art. Right? So this one is going to take a, a few seconds because uh, the service needs to be reached out and it needs to generate the data and you know, perform the scale and so on. But here it is. So uh, this is the, the current reading of the, of the uh, weather radar. And if we look into the, the, the services page from uh, NOAA, and we see the metadata associated with this radar that I was reading. There is a, a color map that uh, can be can be uh, can be used to tell what's the what's the meaning of each color. So here we have it. So we can you know I'm not creating another UDF for this one, but uh, you know uh, if you are really interested, you could also look into parsing this data and uh, uh, making it available as part of the output of the UDF. OK. Uh, now, we also have quite a few processes associated with the translation between data formats. Uh, I think that uh, this one is pretty much what I had shown you before with the GeoTIFF. So right, we have uh, input in one format. You want to translate it to another. And we also have uh, elements that transform the data. So sometimes you have quite a lot of operations before the data can be loaded and uh, analytics can run on it. Uh, I'm going to show you another example then. So what we have here uh, is a collection of three elements of a pipeline. Say the very first element is going to take the input and it's going to blend uh, the, the two pieces of raw data uh, in, in such a way that we, we are just creating the average of those uh, raw one and raw two data. And we are outputting that as a uh, a blended data set, that's the name we are creating. Uh, then we have a second piece of UDF, which is going to take as input the blended data. It's going to generate a normalized data, which is uh, basically uh, you know, data normalized between zero and one. And finally, we have a transformation, uh, let me use colors to output this, uh, a transformation element which takes the normalized data and simply transforms it by reversing the array. I don't know, this is just to show you some, some, some stuff going on. And mind uh, the calls to print. Okay, so each time I'm going to execute the UDF, I'm going to print a message so you can see what's going on. So let me uh, execute those, uh, let me embed those uh, UDFs first. So there you go. So I have the raw data and I have the three UDFs that I have just produced. Uh, and now uh, I'm going to dump the first data set, raw one. So you can see this is just a numerical data uh, starting with uh, zero, one, two, three, going up to 1039. I'm going to do the same thing with the uh, row two. Again, just a, a regular sequence of numbers going up to 2000. And then let's see what happens when we read uh, the blended data set. So, oops, you can see that we have numbers between uh, 1000 and 2000 here. And if we go up, we can see that we have this message being echoed here. So the UDF executed. So we are blending the raw data. Now, what happens when we execute the normalized data uh, set, uh, UDF? So again, we are seeing numbers, different numbers, this time between zero and one. And if we jump to the beginning of this dump command, we see that we have the planned message and the normalizing message. So because we had the blended data set as input, to the, to the normalized uh, UDF, it executed first. So we have a chaining of uh, events happening here. 
And of course, the same thing is going to happen when we ask the reader to transform the data set. This time, the list is in reverse order. It starts with zero, actually starts with one and goes down to zero. And going up, we can see the three messages, blending raw data, normalizing the blended data, and transforming the normalized data. So uh, what is very cool about this is the fact that we have a very simple way to cascade events. And you, know, you have a very natural way to express uh, the dependencies between uh, uh, steps of your pipeline. Uh, yeah, so this this is uh, this is what I want to show for this uh, this part of the presentation. And what you can see is that the data lineage this time is made much easier. So you no longer have to cope with several copies of the data. You are basically having one input data, uh, and you're creating or enhancing it with uh, scripts or uh, routines that are gonna execute and uh, clean the data for you when that's needed. Uh, now, uh, there is one particular point uh, of concern uh, for anyone uh, dealing with data that comes from external uh, sources, which is the fact that, okay, you're executing code, right? Uh, so how about uh, trust? Would you trust third-party uh, files? <laughs> Well, of course, I would not. <laughs> uh, I hope you would not uh, as well. Uh, so we uh, have been looking from the very beginning into protecting uh, the execution of UDFs. And for, uh, for the time being, we are using uh, a mechanism uh, available on, on Linux called the SecCon. It is a feature that lets you define a list of system calls that you allow a process to execute, in this case, a UDF. And you can also specify some of the arguments that you allow to, to be provided to those system calls. So for example, you may want to say that open is a system call that you allow, but uh, only uh, in read only mode. Uh, if you have a write flag set, then you deny uh, and kill the process that violates that rule. Uh, the only limitation with the second is the fact that you cannot provide strings as uh, uh, valid elements. Uh, as filters. So we have to use another set of uh, 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 approaches to incorporate support for strings so that you can filter based on path. Uh, and then there is this library from, from Intel called syscall intercept. And basically, we use it to uh, hook specific uh, system calls that we have allowed to run. And then we can say, OK, is this an open call? Yes, this is an open call. So if the path is different from, say, uh, dots, uh, anything dot CSV, then I deny that call. So something like that. Uh, it is possible to you know, create a very rich rules using a combination of those two uh, elements. And here at the bottom, what you see is uh, how this pipeline uh, works inside the UDF. So we load the dependencies first. Uh, you, you, you've seen the row one and row two. Uh, examples before. So we load those data into memory. Then we prepare uh, the, the data that the UDF needs to execute. We set up a shared memory segment so that the fork the process that we are creating can write uh, and populate the output region. Uh, and then uh, once that process executed, the output region is finally transferred to the uh, output data set. And Mind here that we are executing uh, this in a forked uh, process, so it's a different process. It has a different namespace. Uh, we can completely isolate this process as we, we wish. And for the time being, uh, there is this limitation, which is the fact that second is uh, a feature available on Linux only. And uh, the syscall intercept library is only available on x86, 64. And also, it's dependent on glibc, which is the standard C library for Linux. Uh, so those are limitations. If we want to have a port for macOS, we're going to have to either disable uh, uh, security uh, temporarily, or we are going to have to port this uh, security uh, element uh, using different APIs. Uh, there is an ongoing effort. Uh, uh, to improve uh, security. Uh, and what we have in mind right now is to have uh, the use of uh, public and private keys. So say we have a, a set of users writing UDFs. Uh, 
uh, once a user writes a UDF, the UDF is signed with their private key. And then the public key is shipped as metadata. It goes on the JSON file uh, metadata. And when the uh, application reads the UDF, uh, there is the option to import that uh, uh, public key. Uh, and then you can have this option to associate uh, different keys with certain profiles. You may have a untrusted profile with, uh, which denies uh, any system call. You may have a default profile which allows memory allocations and get time of day and so on, or a trusted profile, which is probably going to be the case when you're running your own UDF. So you, know, uh, you want to have uh, uh, the ability to run uh, your own code on your own machine without any restrictions, most likely. So this is an ongoing effort. We are uh, uh, making sure that the next release uh, includes this. Uh, so having said all of this, this is the, the bulk of the presentation. Uh, I want to keep up with the tradition. And I have a nice uh, UDF here that I'm pretty sure you're going to enjoy. So uh, as uh, Gerd mentioned uh, in the first uh, uh, user group meeting, uh, which I attended, I've shown a demo of Doom, uh, the classic Doom game running uh, on HDF5. And this time, what I did was to port Prince of Persia. So Prince of Persia is also a classic game that many people like. And what I'm doing here, let me show you what I did to the source code first. So uh, what I'm doing here, this is the, the source code of the game. I've modified the, the game engine so that the, the frame buffer is allocated on a shared memory segment. So I'm using inter-process communication here. And uh, the game can write and read from that region just fine, just as if uh, the uh, screen was allocated on uh, memory allocated with malloc. But because I'm saving this on a shared memory segment, I can use a UDF that attaches to that memory segment and reads from that segment of memory. And then I have this. Uh, utility that just dumps each frame of the game uh, as we play it. So uh, just to go through the example here, this is a C++ uh, dynamic data set. I'm reading the frame buffer, uh, and I actually I'm taking input from this frame buffer. I'm uh, attaching to, to the shared memory segment, and then I'm calling a mem copy operation. Now, uh, let me launch the game so you can see it in action. So this is it. Just switch. So the demo is going to be pretty much the same as I shown you before with the radar. I'm going to launch an X terminal, uh, and I'm going to read the HDF5 file on uh, you know in a in a loop. Let's see what happens? Oh, I think I forgot to execute the UDF. Oops. Huh. Ah, OK, so let me run the code first. Uh, there you go. Let's see what happens when you don't have a data set. OK, we run it now. There you go. So this is it. Let me play a little bit, and you can see it in action. So just to emphasize, this is uh, the screen uh, that's capturing the output of the data set, and this is the game screen. So you can see it's. Uh, it's actually reproducing the, the frame buffer contents as expected. So there you go. Uh, so this is what I had to show you today. I hope you had uh, some fun and you, you've learned something interesting today. I'm very happy to take your questions uh, now. Please uh, feel free to, to ask anything you have in mind. Yeah, uh, please. Yeah, unmute yourself if you have a question. And uh, yeah. Yes, I have a question. I'm still unclear that once I create a UDF file, what it takes to read it. In other words, can I assume any standard library that can read HDF can read it, or do I need yes, something yes, else yes. to read it? Yes, the only thing you need is to is to ship the, the library itself. Uh, so as I've shown here in the slide, we have a set of uh, the IO filter interface works with this uh, concept of plugins. So you have a, uh, a DLL, say, for the plugin that you want to, to, to use uh, to read or write the data. 
So you just have to ship this uh, uh, shared library with the data or just uh, compile it up front or install it up front and then you'll be able to run VDS. There's no modification to the uh, application side. Mm -hmm. I can, there, there is a question here, uh, someone posted on the chat. Uh, can HDF5 UDF work on streaming data with unlimited dimensions? Uh, for example, can a log file in CSV that keeps appending new data uh, and growing in unlimited size uh, be used as an input for an HDF5 UDF? Well, uh, for the time being, uh, what we have is uh, the interface, as you have seen, it has a uh, you, you need to determine, determine what's the size of the data set. Uh, so you have, you can say that the data set has a, a billion lines and then you write your application in a way that it stops at the first null line or something like that. Uh, that is a current limitation of the APIs we are using. And, you know, uh, there is no way to do that right now uh, in, a, in, a, uh, in a format that leaves the time dimension, if you will, uh, unlimited. Mm -hmm. uh, can, oh, uh, here's another question. Can it work with NetCDF4 files? And yes, yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Uh, there is absolutely no modification uh, to, to run this on uh, NetCDF4 because NetCDF4 is built on top of HDF5. So uh, all the examples I have shown here also work with uh, NetCDF4. In fact, uh, I have even some backup slides here uh, that show uh, some examples of uh, UDFs that take input from NetCDF4. In this case, it's a, a piece of uh, code that outputs the wind chill, the wind speed, and the heat index from uh, uh, results output by the WARF model. So this is a uh, this is something we have been using as well. So it is totally possible to, to use NetCDF4 and many other uh, formats based on NetCDF, uh, HDF5. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then there was sort of a second part to that question, which was regarding the NetCDF Java library, which I imagine uses JNI or something like that to call into the native code. So since native code works by extension, I would think NetCDF Java should work yes. as well. Yes, 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 yes. Of course, the UDF that you are going to write uh, needs to be written in Python, C++, or Lua for the time being. It will be possible to have a Java uh, backend as well. Uh, but you know, uh, even so, uh, it is possible to have the Java binding uh, uh, reading uh, data written in, in Python, for example. Mm -hmm. Hello. Uh, can I have a question? Hi, yes. Please. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I was just wondering if you could talk just a little bit about what are the prerequisites uh, uh, software-wise. What what do I have to install in my machine, for example, if I want to insert UDFs into a, into an existing H5 file? And once I do that, if I want to share that file with another person, what does the other person have to install in order to read my my H5 with the UDF? Okay, so let me show you here. So uh, dependencies we have are pretty much uh, these. Uh, there we go. Uh, so if you can you can opt to enable or disable certain backends, assuming that you uh, uh, want to write the uh, code in C and C++ uh, or UDFs in C C++, uh, you just have to have the the C compiler from from GNU uh, or from C Lang. Then the second library, if you build it with support for uh, for uh, you know uh, sandboxing, along with the uh, syscall intercept, but those are optional. We are not uh, concerned about that, and uh, that is very much it. You do not have to have any other modules in this case. If you uh, want to run Python code, you have to have the CFFI module installed and uh, the Python libraries too. Uh, but that's it. And for the legit. Uh, and then you have to have the, the Lua engine or the Python uh, libraries installed on the target machine so the bytecode can execute again. 
Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. So, the, so the, the security uh, libraries that you mentioned are only optional, right? If I want to restrict what they it, uh... are only optional. Yes. For instance, uh, the demos that I, I have shown you here, they are using shared memory at, uh, attachment and you know things which are not very uh, safe to allow. So the build I have uh, running on my machine is uh, not using a sandbox. So it is possible to get rid of that if you are not concerned. Okay. Mm -hmm. There is another question here in the chat. Uh, can the UDF execution use multiple CPUs? Yes, yes. Uh, you can have uh, p threads, uh, or you know, you can have uh, super processes. You can, as long as the uh, sandboxing rules allow you to launch new processes, it is totally possible to do that. Uh, you can have uh, open MP or even MPI processes being launched from a uh, UDF. That's totally possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One aspect that I think you touched on this a little bit, if you, if you, I mean, you can look at this from so many different angles, workflows and so forth, but also from the perspective of uh, provenance, reproducible research and so forth. And then you can go further if you look at um, what, what uh, we do in, in software um, uh, deployment, for example, with tools like SPAC or on the OS side that's a little more co uh, comprehensive, something like GNU Geeks. Um, and if you add uh, HDR5 UDF to that, you in a way get a completely new kind of applications in the sense that it's not just. That's right. Oops, I think I've lost your audio. Uh... I wonder if that's only. Yeah, I, I saw it. Okay, it's back, it's back now. Sorry. Uh -huh. so yeah. Yes, yes. You, 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 you do indeed have a completely new way to, to you know, write uh, uh, data processing pipelines. Uh, this is uh, something that has a lot of potential, uh, the way I see it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, uh, I'm, I'm keeping an eye on the clock here. So we have. Uh, about five more minutes. Uh, are there any other questions? No? Yeah, it's uh, it's just stunning. And now on the HDF5 side, uh, and, and uh, I'm sure we'll discuss that and uh, uh, some of it on the forum maybe. So far, you are using the filter pipelines. That's, of course, again, it's one implementation vehicle. HDF, UDF is, of course, a concept that can be implemented in many different ways in HDF. And the, the filter pipeline so far seems to work, but we know there are limitations to what right. uh, filters can do and cannot do. And the, uh, from your perspective, what are sort of the main limitations that you have encountered? and Maybe you have some plans already to uh, use another way to implement an even broader uh, uh, UDF, if you want to use that term. Okay, so uh, the, the one limitation that uh, we have is the fact that in order to write a UDF, we are basically mapping the source code, or actually the, the bytecode, into a chunked uh, piece of data. Uh, and then it's, uh, say you have a, you're creating, let's say that your UDF is creating a numerical grid of uh, 1,000 by 1,000 pixels. Uh, when you create this, uh, this fake chunk, uh, which contains the bytecode, uh, we tell uh, HDF5 that this chunk contains 1,000 by 1,000 uh, elements. So it is not possible to split uh, the data produced by the UDF into smaller chunks. So if the user requests, if, if the user is only concerned about say one pixel, uh, it is not possible to request just a window or a, a subset of the data. We will have to you know, create the whole thing and you know, pass the entire data to the application. So that is one limitation that we have with the filter interface. Uh, the other limitation uh, comes from the fact that filters do not know about what's the file that's open. Uh, there is no handle uh, propagation to the filter API. Uh, we do have some metadata, but not the file handle. So when we have data coming from uh, 
uh, say uh, from other data sets as input, like uh, raw data one, raw data two, uh, we have to resort to some tricks like looking into slash proc, slash PID, mm -hmm. slash uh, FD to learn what's the file descriptors opened by the process. Then you identify what's an uh, HDF5 file there, and then you try to find the, the data in there. So there's a lot of balance in here, and this ends up uh, adding a uh, dependency on Linux because we do not have proc on Windows or uh, on Mac OS. Uh, we would have to have different backends to try to get a handle to the uh, original file. So those are, uh, I think, the two major limitations with the filter API. But otherwise, it is a really good uh, interface to use because it uh, allows the project to walk uh, on, you know, on its own. We do not have any dependencies or we do not have to merge code uh, to the main uh, HDF5 project. So we can experiment with a lot of ideas and uh, you know, maybe they are not appropriate to merge to the, to the main project, but uh, once they mature enough, maybe we can try to consider a different uh, uh, layer uh, in the UDF uh, mm -hmm. HDF5 stack, like uh, the VFT, for example or virtual file uh, drivers. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But that is not That's something that is on my on my horizon. I'm uh, actually more uh -huh. concerned about uh, writing new stuff and you know uh, having some fun <laughs> with yeah. uh, with the uh, new features uh, and I'm less concerned about where it's uh, going to fit best. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, of course, I'm sure we'll talk about that more. It's really after you also seeing how you in, in a sense execute these applications or these pipelines these packages it's really it's like a jar if you wish in a java world it's just that now we have also all the data not just the code there and it's really more like a dispatch mechanism there are all these different choices and you are just choosing to dispatch a particular uh, subgraph or uh, subset and so also from a tools perspective i think it it shows a completely new way how we might be able to sort of package and develop uh, HDF tools uh, rather than standalone executables uh, right. make them really much more powerful and self-contained and you know. right right precisely and uh, there is one thing also which is uh, quite interesting to mention which is the fact that uh, when you have uh, this ability to execute data uh, when you read the UDF, uh, sorry, you, you produce the data when you read the UDF. Uh, this is uh, bringing that, uh, that uh, famous uh, message, which is that, you know, you're bringing computation to where data is. This is literally yeah. it, you know, you're basically computing exactly inside the data uh, file itself. So this is a, this is a, a Interesting. Uh, yeah, when, yeah. In and then, and finally, we, uh, I see we are running out of time in two minutes. But then, it also brings this interesting. I, I think uh, that that there are some theoretical computer science studies. This Kolmogorov complexity, for example, where people say, well, how complex is does the code need to be to produce a certain data set? And then, yeah, you trade off, well, how much storage would it take to store that data set and then really try to find the sweet spot, but then also find, yeah, yeah, that crossover where it might be better to materialize or partially materialize some of these UDF represented in some form data sets, just like, yeah, you can memorize or, or persist a closure or a right. function or right. something right. like that. And yeah. Oh, sorry. There's one more question here. Can you regard um, uh, Meteor forcing to an ocean model onto a different grid, also regrading? Yeah. In other words, could you do regrading? I would imagine yes. 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 Uh, we uh, actually that that was one of the very first examples I wrote uh, when when HDF five UDF was being uh, written. So you can have uh, smaller sets of the of the data. So you can have like pyramids, right? Different resolutions. Uh, that is uh, totally possible. Okay, uh, time is up. Uh, thank you very much for a very exciting uh, presentation. I'm sorry for the people who missed it, but then hey, they will get the benefit of a, I hope, <laughs> YouTube recording. They can enjoy it on YouTube with a beer or their preferred <laughs> beverage. <laughs> and uh,
thank you very much. And uh, yeah, let's continue the discussion on the forum. To me, this is very, very exciting, very original work, and then it will change change the future. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Thank you very much, uh, all. Thank and, you, uh, and thanks everybody for coming. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lucas, and everyone else. Thank you. Bye.